Got to bend down. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome. We are getting ready to get started. Please take your seats. We will be live streaming. And I will be asking those of you all who are not shy, please come as close to the front as possible so we can look well during our live stream. <laughs> so please, don't be shy. Work your way to the front. Thank you so much, and welcome. Good afternoon, again. My name is Jeffrey Hicks. I serve as president of the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, NARAB. And I welcome all of you to our Issues Forum. For 71 years, the National Association of Real Estate Brokers has represented and fought for democracy and housing. And today, we continue toward that goal in presenting this Issues Forum, a 50-year journey the Fair Housing Act to the current state of housing in black America. Our goal in the next two hours is not only to remember and acknowledge and understand the past, but equally, it is just as important to present solutions to reverse what seems to be like intractable trends trends that leave us today with a black homeownership rate of 41.6%, nearly the same as it was just two years after the signing of the Fair Housing Act of 1968. Yes, there are reasons. There has been decades of federal, state, and local government supported discriminatory housing and housing finance policies, disparate lending patterns, redlining, exploitation, resulting in unimaginable losses of wealth. But let me be clear, we are here today assembled in this room to begin down a road to solutions, identifying the key areas where policy changes can have a measurable impact and create a space for true democracy in housing, allowing all peoples of our nation to climb up the middle class ladder to build wealth through home ownership. NARAB believes it's possible and doable. The expert panelists here today also believe this is possible. And from each of their perspectives, will share what they believe to be solutions, based approaches, and strategies that remove the barriers obstructing the growth of black home ownership and black wealth. It gives me Great pleasure and honor to introduce our panelists. They are warriors and true tellers in their respective areas of expertise and understand the journey to real democracy and housing. We have with us today James Carr, Coleman A. Young Endowed Chair and Professor at Wayne State University and co-author of NARAB's State of Housing in Black America Report. We also have with us, with us 
Ms. Elena McCargo, Vice President of Housing Finance and Policy at the Urban Institute. I like to refer to him as our data genius, Mr. Maurice Jordan Earl, Managing Director and Co-Founder of Compliance Tech. Lisa Rice, President and CEO of the National Fair Housing Alliance, and Mark Austin, who is NARAV's Public Affairs Committee Chair and owner of Skyway Realty and Austin Associates Mortgage Company. Let's give our panel a warm welcome. <laughs> Following our keynote address, our panelists will make their way onto the stage. Now, just a few housekeeping keeping items before we begin. First, I'm pleased again to say this session is being live streamed. We want the information and solutions shared with, uh, with, uh, with you all, not only in this room, but with everyone interested in democracy and housing. Please feel free to share the live stream site should be on the screen. Can we get that on the screen, please? The live stream site. Please comment via text, tweet, and share what you believe to be important with us and with our network. Use the hashtag democracy and housing. The panelists will be taking questions from the audience. You will receive a card. When you, when, when you came in the room, it may, it may be in your seats. If you have a question, write it on the card, hold the card up, and they will be collected and given to me. Please direct your question to the panelists or the panel in general. We'll pick them up and respond to as many as possible during the Q&A. We'll also be taking questions from viewers watching the live stream. We are expecting Congressman Gregory Meeks to be with us. Uh, he may be delayed uh, entering the room, but when he does, we, we will make uh, adjustments to honor him and other co congressional leaders that we expect to attend our session. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let us begin our program and thank you again for joining us. Today's keynote speaker is Mr. Richard Rothstein. He is a research associate of the Economic Policy Institute, a fellow at the Thurgood Marshall Institute of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and a fellow of the Haas Institute at the University of California, Berkeley. Mr. Rothstein is one of the most recognized and authoritative experts on educational challenges facing blacks in America. We have invited him to join us today to discuss his recent book on blacks in housing titled The Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America. Please give a warm CBC welcome to Mr. Richard Washington. Thank you very much, President Hicks. Is this on? Yeah. Okay. And thanks to all of you for uh, coming here this afternoon to engage with me in this conversation. As you all know, uh, in the 20th century, we made a resolution, a national resolution, 
to end racial segregation. Uh, we understood that racial segregation was wrong. It was immoral. It was harmful to both blacks and to whites. And it was unconstitutional, incompatible with our self-conception as a constitutional democracy. Uh, civil rights lawyers began in the 1930s challenging first segregation in law schools because they figured that if judges couldn't understand anything else, they might be able to understand you couldn't get a good legal education in a segregated law school. And then they used that precedent to challenge segregation in other uh, institutions of higher education, colleges and universities. And then, as you all know, those precedents were built upon and led to the decision of the Supreme Court in 1954 in Brown versus Board of Education to abolish legal segregation in elementary and secondary schools. And then the Brown decision gave a new impetus to a civil rights movement that involved not just litigation, but marches and demonstrations and civil disobedience to abolish segregation in other areas of American life. Everything from buses to lunch counters to public accommodations of all kind, even, even water fountains. And yet, having done all this, we've left untouched the biggest segregation of all, which is that every metropolitan area in this country is residentially segregated. I've lived in many of them. Every one I've lived in, there have been clearly defined areas that were either mostly white or all white, and clearly defined areas that were mostly black or all black. How is it that having come to an understanding that we needed to abolish racial segregation, we've left untouched the biggest segregation of all? Part of it, I think, is of course it's harder to desegregate neighborhoods than it is to desegregate water fountains. If you desegregate water fountains, the next day you can drink from any water fountain. But if you desegregate neighborhoods, the next day things don't look much different. And so we've abolished the rationalization. We've, we've established the rationalization. Uh, something we've convinced ourselves to justify to ourselves. The fact that we've not done anything about residential segregation. That we accept it as part of the natural environment. Something we think is probably too bad, but not something we can do anything about. And that rationalization is a national myth. It's a myth that, unlike all the other segregations that I just described, segregation in housing wasn't created by government. It's all just private activity that did this. It's prejudiced white homeowners who wouldn't sell homes to African Americans, or real estate agents or banks that wouldn't show homes to African Americans in white neighborhoods. Or maybe we tell ourselves that people just like to live with each other of the same race. Or maybe it's that African American incomes aren't great enough to move into middle class white neighborhoods. All of these excuses, all of these rationalizations is why we have residential segregation. And we tell ourselves that if residential segregation all happened by accident, unlike the other kinds of segregation that I described, well, it can only unhappen by accident. And the Supreme Court has adopted that view. It's uh, given a name to it, a name that has become part of popular language. We all use it. What the Supreme Court says is that residential segregation is de facto. It sort of happened in fact, but not in law. And the Supreme Court has said that if you have de facto segregation, not only is there nothing you can do about it, you're nothing, there's nothing that you're permitted to do, do about it. Well, I spent many years studying education policy. Um, as President Hicks described, that's what most of my work, previous work was. And so in 2007, I read a Supreme Court decision in the field of education. Two school districts, one in Louisville, Kentucky, the other in Seattle, Washington, established a very, very token uh, desegregation plan. Uh, they both had school choice programs. Children could choose which school in the district they would go to. But if the choice was going to further imbalance the school racially, that choice wouldn't be honored in the favor of the choice of a child who would help to desegregate the school. So if you had, for example, a, 
a school in Louisville or Seattle that was all white or mostly white, and there was one place left in that school, and both a black and a white child applied for it, uh, the black child be given some preference. Token, token plan. I mean, this is not going to accomplish very much. Uh, most children don't want to go to school outside their same neighborhoods in the first place. And the cases where you have one place left in the school and both a black and a wild, white child apply for it is trivial. And yet the Supreme Court was outraged. Um, Chief Justice John Roberts wrote the, the decision, and he said that the districts of Louisville and Seattle were violating the Constitution when they implemented this program. He said they were violating the Constitution because the schools in Louisville and Seattle were segregated because the neighborhoods in which they're located were segregated. Well, I agreed with that. I thought that was a pretty wise observation on the Chief Justice's part. Um, in fact, schools are more segregated today than they have been at any time in the last 45 years uh, because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. But then he went on to say that the neighborhoods in Louisville and Seattle are segregated de facto, just by accident, just because of all the things I described, private prejudice, bankers and real estate agents discriminating or um, income differences or people just liking to live with each other of the same race. And he said, if you have de facto segregation, it's a violation of the Constitution to remedy it. Well, as I say, these, this case arose out of two school districts, Seattle, Washington, and Louisville, Kentucky. And I read this case and I remembered reading about a case some years before where a white homeowner in Louisville, Kentucky, one of the districts involved in this case, had an African-American friend. The white homeowner was living in a single-family home in the suburb of Louisville. The African-American friend, a decorated Navy veteran, a fellow with a good middle-class income, a wife and a child, wanting to move to a, a suburban community, but no, no real estate agent would, would show him a home in that community. And so the white homeowner bought another home in, in this suburb and resold it to his African-American friend. That was really the only way in those days an African-American would ever buy a home, a single-family home, but he resold it to his African-American friend. And when the African-American friend moved in with his family, a mob surrounded the home, um, protected by the police. Uh, they threw rocks through the windows. Uh, the police surrounded the mob but couldn't identify any perpetrators. They firebombed and dynamited the home. Police couldn't identify any perpetrators, just couldn't see who did it. And then when this riot was all over, the state of Kentucky arrested, tried, convicted, and jailed with a 15-year sentence the white homeowner for sedition for having sold this home to an African-American friend. And I said to myself, this doesn't sound to me much like de facto segregation. Maybe if the police and the prosecutors and the courts are this involved in reinforcing and perpetuating segregation, maybe there's more to the story that Chief Justice Roberts doesn't know. And so that's the origins of my book uh, called The Color of Law. I wanted to know if, if um, state involvement, government involvement in racial segregation was um, just occasional and, and uh, incidental like this case, or whether it was systematic, whether this whole thing was a myth that government wasn't involved in creating residential segregation. And, what I um, found in the course of my research and what I've described in this book is that indeed we do not have de facto segregation. It's an <coughs> other myth. There's no such thing. What we have in this country is a government-sponsored, government-created system of residential segregation, the history of which we've entirely forgotten in this country. It was once well known. There's nothing hidden about this. And because we've forgotten this history, because we've adopted this myth, we fear, feel powerless to do something about it. If we understood, if we understood the history of how government policy is what created residential segregation, it would be easy for us to figure out how to develop equally powerful government policies to undo it. But so long as we think it's accidental, it's much more difficult to take up the challenge of continuing the civil rights revolution that began in the 20th century. So let me describe to you um, in a few minutes this afternoon some of the major policies that the government followed to create residential segregation in this country, policies that have never been remedied. One of them was public housing. Now, all of us think we know what public housing is. It's a place where poor people live. It's a place where lots of mothers, uh, single mothers with children, 
Um, <laughs> um, would you please silence your cell phones? Uh, um, it's a place where poor people live. Uh, single mothers with children, um, lots of young men uh, without jobs in the formal economy, uh, acting out, engaging in oppositional behavior, getting involved in confrontations with the police that end tragically. Uh, that's not how public housing began in this country. Public housing began in this country during the New Deal, during the Franklin Roosevelt administration in the 1930s and the Depression, and it was not a program for poor people. Poor people were not permitted into public housing. It was a program for middle class, working class families who had enough income to afford to rent housing, but for whom there was no housing available because nothing was being built during the Depression. The first New Deal agency, the Public Works Administration, built housing around the country. Public housing for working class families. You had to have a job and a good employment history to get in. Um, you had to show your employment record. You have to demonstrate to investigators that you had high quality furniture that wouldn't reduce the standards of public housing. And everywhere in the country, the Public Works Administration built this housing. It built it in a segregated basis, separate projects for whites and separate projects for African Americans, frequently creating segregation that hadn't previously existed. Now that may surprise you, but there was much more integration in urban areas in the mid to early 20th century than there is today. We would be stunned, all of us, if we could be transported back to the 20th century to see the extent of segregation that existed. Uh, the great poet, uh, novelist, playwright, uh, Langston Hughes, describes how he grew up in an integrated Cleveland neighborhood. He said in high school his best friend was Polish. He dated a Jewish girl. This was not, I'd say, the norm in 20th century America, but it wasn't unique either. Well, that neighborhood in Cleveland, that integrated neighborhood in Cleveland where Langston Hughes grew up, was demolished by the Public Works Administration in order to build two separate projects, one for whites and one for African Americans, creating a pattern of segregation in Cleveland, reinforcing a pattern of segregation in Cleveland with that and other projects that otherwise would never have developed with such strength. And this, as I say, was done all over the country. In, in my book, I like to talk about self-satisfied places like Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, some of you may have heard of it. Uh, the area between MIT and Harvard in Cambridge was an integrated neighborhood called the Central Square neighborhood. The Public Works Administration, was about half white and half black. The Public Works Administration demolished housing in that neighborhood to build separate projects, one for blacks, one for whites, creating a pattern of segregation in Cambridge and throughout the Boston area with that and other projects that would not otherwise have existed. During World War II, this pattern, this policy of the federal government and local and state governments as well intensified because during World War II, hundreds of thousands of workers flocked to centers of defense production to take jobs in war industries, jobs that hadn't previously existed in the, in the Depression. They overwhelmed the, the communities where the war plants were located. Um, in, in my book, again, I talk about uh, another self-satisfied place, Berkeley, California. Um, Berkeley, California, and a suburb of Berkeley called Richmond was the center of shipbuilding on the West Coast, a deep water port. Uh, at the beginning of World War II, Richmond was a tiny town, 20,000 white, white people, uh, virtually no African Americans living there. There were a couple on the outskirts, uh, but uh, no African Americans really living in Richmond. The shipyards in Richmond, which were created at the beginning of World War II, by the end of World War II, employed 100,000 workers. Um, you know, if you consider that many of them had uh, uh, wives and children, um, it was an influx in po of population into this tiny community of 20,000 of 300,000 people. How do you grow a community of, <laughs> I guess all of you would love that business, <laughs> grow a community from 20,000 to 300,000 in just four years? It's inconceivable. The only way it could be done, if the government wanted those ships to continue to be produced, and if it wanted elsewhere in the country, the tanks and the airplanes and the jeeps to continue to be produced. It had to build housing for the workers who were coming there from all over the country, white and black. And the government did build housing. It built segregated housing everywhere in the country. You cannot say, in the example I just gave, Richmond, California, that this was 
simply honoring local patterns. Not that it would have been constitutional to honor local patterns if they were discriminatory, but you can't say that they were honoring local patterns because there were very, very few African Americans living on the West Coast prior to World War II. The big mass migration of African Americans to California and to Oregon and to Washington came during the war for these war industry jobs. But the, so the federal government established a pattern of segregation by creating two separate projects or separate housing for African Americans and whites in Berkeley, in Richmond itself, in a little tiny community between Berkeley and Richmond called Albany. It built housing, shoddy housing, temporary housing for the black workers along the railroad tracks in the industrial area and more stable housing for the white workers in the residential areas. The city of Richmond announced it wasn't necessary to build stable housing for the black workers because uh, they would all have to leave Richmond at the end of World War II and the white workers would be permitted to stay. This was government policy. There was nothing de facto about this. The entire West Coast was segregated by these policies. Los Angeles, the San Francisco Bay Area that I just mentioned, Seattle, uh, Portland, all of these cities would not be segregated today were it not for these government policies during World War II. Well, after World War II, there was an enormous housing shortage still in the country. Not only um, was no housing built in the Depression except for these public projects that I described for, for working class families on a segregated basis, and during World War II, it was uh, prohibited by law uh, to use construction materials for civilian purposes unless you were building housing for workers at defense plants. And then millions of returning war veterans were coming home, uh, needing housing, and there was no housing available for them. So President Truman, in, uh, in 1949, newly elected, proposed a vast expansion of the national public housing program. And remember, we're talking about housing for working class families. These were returning war veterans, people who had jobs in the post-war boom, uh, not poor people. But he wanted a vast expansion of the National Public Housing Program to house returning veterans uh, and others. And conservatives in Congress wanted to defeat Truman's National Public Housing Program. They wanted to defeat it not for racial reasons, because it was always segregated. Everybody knew that. Uh, they didn't object to that. It's not because they didn't like poor people, because it wasn't for poor people. It was for working class families. They wanted to defeat it because they thought that public housing was socialistic and the, market, the private market should be taking care of the needs of returning war veterans, even though the private market wasn't doing so. And so he proposed, the, the, the conservatives in Congress decided they had a strategy for defeating the 1949 Housing Act, and that is something, a, a, a congressional strategy that we call a poison pill strategy. A poison pill strategy is one where opponents of a bill attach an amendment to the bill which they think can get passed. But once the amendment is attached to the bill, it makes the entire bill go down to defeat. And so conservatives in Congress, get this, conservatives in Congress proposed an amendment to the 1949 Housing Act that from now on, public housing had to be integrated. No more segregation in public housing. No more discrimination in public housing. Of course, it was a cynical proposal. They didn't want public housing at all. Uh, but they figured they would vote for this amendment cynically they would be joined by uh, northern democratic liberals in, in the Senate and, and the House. That would create a majority to attach the integration amendment to the bill. And then once the full bill came up to the floor of Congress as an integrated program, the conservatives would flip and vote against the bill. They would be joined by southern Democrats who were all in favor of public housing if it was segregated but not if it was integrated, and the bill would go down to defeat. So Northern liberals, and I, I, I hope you'll remember this story because it, it, it resonates today in the debates we have about policy today. Northern liberals campaigned against the integration amendment in order to save public housing. The leading liberal in the Senate, there were really two. One was Hubert Humphrey, um, who later became vice president. He was known as Mr. Civil Rights. Uh, the other was a senator from Illinois, Paul Douglas. Uh, Senator Douglas got up on the floor of uh, the Senate and made a speech along the following lines. Uh, he said, uh, I want to say to my Negro friends that you'll be better off with segregated housing if this bill is passed than with no housing at all. And um, he persuaded uh, other uh, 
Democratic Congress people to vote against the integration amendment. The integration amendment went down to defeat, and the 1949 Housing Act was passed. You know, uh, to me, 1949 isn't so long ago. You know, it's just recent history. Uh, the 1949 Housing Act was passed as an ongoing segregated program. And the federal government used that vote in Congress as its justification for continuing to segregate all housing programs for the next 15 years, taking us into the mid-1960s. This is not de facto segregation. This is an explicit policy to, desegre to, to segregate the country as unconstitutional as segregation of buses or lunch counters or schools or colleges or water fountains and yet never been remedied. Well, under the 1949 Housing Act, uh, many of the large public housing projects that we know of were built, uh, places in Chicago, uh, maybe some of you uh, remember some of these, uh, Cabrini Green or the Robert Taylor Homes or in St. Louis, uh, the pruitt Igo Towers. Uh, pruitt Igo Towers actually was two separate projects. Pruitt was for African Americans. Igo was for whites. It's not that uh, African Americans happened to like the sound of the word Pruitt, and so that's where they applied, and whites happened to like the sound of the name Igo. This was not self-segregation. This was explicit policy of the government. Very soon afterwards, all over the country, a development occurred, which was quite surprising, uh, but systematic everywhere, and that is that the African American projects, the project, projects designated for African Americans, had long waiting lists. And the projects designated for whites had large numbers of vacancies. Eventually, the situation became so conspicuous and untenable that all of the projects had to be opened up to African Americans. And remember, this is a time when it was still for working families, not for poor people. But at about the same time, some of you may know your urban history, at about the same time, industry left the cities. They no longer needed to be uh, located uh, near deep water ports or near railroad terminals because the highways were being built. So the industry could, to, could relocate to rural areas and to suburban areas and get their raw materials and ship their final products by truck. So fewer and fewer jobs were left for the increasingly African American populations in the public housing. And eventually, uh, the public housing had to be subsidized. Prior to this, the government didn't pay for uh, the rent of families. They paid for it themselves. The government just advanced the money up front to build the projects, but they were self-supporting projects. But now they had to be subsidized. People became poorer and poorer, and we caught this, began to get the kind of public housing that we know today for poor people. Well, the question I want to address next is how did it happen that all of these vacancies occurred in the white projects and not in the black projects? And that was because of another federal program designed explicitly, explicitly, to suburbanize the entire white working class population into single home, family homes in all white suburban communities. This was an explicit racial policy of the federal government. It didn't happen by accident. You're familiar with many of these suburbs, places like Levittown in east of New York City is probably the biggest one and the best well known, but I don't know, maybe some of you remember hearing a song that the, the folk singer Pete Seeger used to sing about the little boxes on the hillside uh, made of ticky tacky and they all looked the same. That was about a, a suburb just as large as Levittown, uh, south of San Francisco. Levittown was 17,000 homes. You all know the financing of housing. Where does a builder like Levitt, William Levitt get the money to build 17,000 homes for which he has no buyers? Any bank would be crazy to lend him the money to build 17,000 homes. He couldn't get the financing for it. The only way he could get the financing for it was by going to the Federal Housing Administration, submitting his plans for the project, for the development. Those plans had to include a commitment never to sell a home to an African American. The Federal Housing Administration even required Levitt and the builders of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these developments everywhere in the country to include a clause in the deed of every home prohibiting resale to African Americans or rental to African Americans. This was not the action of rogue bureaucrats. This was written federal policy. The Federal Underwriting Manual, issued beginning in the 1930s and on into the 1950s, 
prohibited appraisers from recommending a project for federal government guarantees if it was going to be integrated. It even prohibited um, a project from getting federal government bank guarantees if it was all white but was located near where African Americans were living because the manual said it ran the risk of infiltration by incompatible racial elements. That's what the federal manual said. And in fact, in, in, in my book, um, uh, you know, there's a photo of a six foot high concrete wall running a mile, a half mile long that was built uh, at the demand of the Federal Housing Administration, it was in Detroit, in order to separate a um, a development for whites only that it was financing from uh, where African Americans were living nearby. This was a federal government policy explicit. These two policies, public housing, which wound up concentrating African Americans in um, low income areas, either in public housing or, or uh, uh, also in uh, rental housing in urban areas, and the Federal Housing Administration's explicit policy to suburbanize the white population into all white suburbs is what created the segregated patterns that we know today. It's what policymakers who knew this history years ago but have stopped talking about in recent decades called a white noose that the federal government had created to establish around African American urban neighborhoods. This is a federal policy. These two policies, there were many, many others. I've only mentioned three to you, the use of the courts and the judicial system to uh, prosecute anybody who attempted integration, uh, the public housing efforts of both the federal, state, and local governments, and the subsidization of single-family homes for white families in uh, white areas. These uh, policies uh, uh, were the main ones, but there were many, many others. Uh, uh, they went round. They ran from the um, uh, granting of tax exemptions by the Internal Revenue Service to institutions that created segregation in their communities. For example, the University of Chicago. Uh, I used to, as I said before, I used to be involved in education policy. Uh, perhaps one of the most famous educators of the 20th century was uh, Hutchins. Um, uh, president Hutchins at the University of Chicago had an office in the office of the presidency made up of lawyers whose job it was to evict African Americans who moved into the area near the University of Chicago. The University of Chicago was a tax-exempt institution. The Internal Revenue Service was violating the Fifth Amendment when it granted a tax exemption to the University of Chicago when it was uh, uh, following these practices. Many churches in white communities were the headquarters of uh, neighborhood associations that engaged in both violence and in the uh, distribution of legal agreements that prohibited African Americans from leaving their neighborhoods. These were other policies. State real estate licensing boards were violating the 14th Amendment when they issued um, uh, real estate licenses to uh, real estate agents who were members of the National Association of Real Estate Boards in the 1950s and earlier because that association had a code of ethics that prohibited, that prohibited real estate agents from selling homes to African Americans in white neighborhoods. When, the, when uh, as I say, when state licensing agencies licensed those, those brokers and agents, they were violating the 14th Amendment, and it requ all requires a remedy. Well, today, we have segregated neighborhoods all over the country, and this, these segregated patterns create most of the most serious social problems that this country faces. I already mentioned uh, my interest in education. The achievement gap between African American and white children exists primarily because children are going to segregated schools, particularly low income children. When they are concentrated, when you concentrate children with the most serious social and economic disadvantages in single schools, those schools cannot possibly overcome all of the problems that those children are dealing with and achieve at the levels we expect. If those children were not being concentrated in single schools, they could get the kind of special attention that they needed to thrive. Health disparities. There's an enormous uh, difference in life expectancy between African Americans and whites in this country today, differences in disease rates. Those health disparities are in part caused 
by the concentration of African Americans in neighborhoods that are less healthy, that are more polluted, uh, that uh, have less access to healthy food or to good medical care. Of course, the, um, the violence that we see visited upon African American communities by police only exists because we have this cycle created by the concentration of young men without access to good jobs, without hope in single neighborhoods where they engage in oppositional behavior, attract the attention of the police, and a cycle of violence occurs um, with tragic consequences. That could not exist if we did not have this unconstitutional racial segregation. And I would add one more thing. I think the politics of this country today are being polluted by racial segregation. Um, the, uh, the, what we saw, the results of, that we saw in the, 19, in the 2016 election and that we continue to see today coming from this administration could not have happened if so many whites weren't living so far distant from African Americans that they had no common experiences, no idea of how each other lived. So the most serious problems we face in this country stem from racial segregation. And we've done nothing to remedy it, in part because of this myth. Now, how we, what are we going to do? I'm not going to um, take a, a lot of your time uh, to talk about remedies, because we're not ready for remedies yet. The first thing we need to do is disabuse ourselves of this myth. Uh, in the course of um, writing this book, I caused uh, myself to look at all the textbooks the most commonly used in American high schools today to teach American history. Uh, the most commonly used uh, textbook in American history today, or at least as of a couple of years ago when I examined them, something called The Americans. I don't know if any of you are, uh, still have uh, students in high school, or children in high school, grandchildren maybe, they're probably using this textbook or one very like it. It's 1,200 pages. In those 1,200 pages, there is one paragraph that subheaded discrimination in the North. One sentence in that paragraph on housing, and it reads as follows. In the North, African Americans found themselves in segregated housing. That's it. You know, they woke up one morning, they looked out the window, and they said, hey, you know, we're in segregated housing. No mention of how it happened. No mention, there's lots of, lots of pages devoted to the wonderful things that the New Deal did about creating homes in the suburbs, working class families but no mention of the fact that it wasn't for all working class families, it was only for some of them. No mention, the great mention of the, the Public Works Administration and the ways it stimulated the economy, the economy by building public housing and other institutions. No mention of the fact that it was done on a segregated basis. This is a crime because if the next generation doesn't learn this history any better than we've learned it, they're gonna be in as poor a position to remedy it as we've been. And so the first thing I, I urge you to do in your communities is to see how this history is being taught. And if it's being lied about, as is the case in most schools in this country, we need to do something about that first, to create the beginnings of a new civil rights movement that's going to continue the unfinished work of the civil rights movement of the 20th century. <laughs> Once we've done that, once we've done that, we can begin to have the kinds of conversations necessary to figure out remedies. And there are many conversations that we can have and many possible remedies. I can give you just a few of them. Some of them have to do with your, your profession, but many of them don't. You know, we have um, uh, uh, a number of programs that the federal government runs today to um, uh, subsidize housing. The biggest program that the federal government runs today to subsidize housing as a subsidy for homeowners, as you all know, including in all white suburbs. It's the mortgage interest deduction. One of the things I suggest in my book is that we should withhold the mortgage interest deduction from homeowners in suburbs that are segregated, that refuse to take steps to desegregate. It doesn't have to be punitive. We can put the mortgage interest deduction from those communities in escrow and when the communities take steps to desegregate, we can return it to the homeowners. Nobody will lose any money that way, but it will be an incentive for all white communities to desegregate. But, you know, fanciful though that may be, there are some practical things that we could do immediately at the low end, which doesn't involve home ownership. Uh, well, one of them does. We should be subsidizing African Americans to uh, uh, first time home, buy home buyers to buy homes in segregated suburbs that 
they now have no access to because the homes in these suburbs are now unaffordable. I mentioned Levittown and these other suburbs. You know, when they were built, they cost in today's dollars about $100,000. Today, those homes sell, as you know better than I do, they sell for three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000, depending on the part of the country. Uh, the white families who bought those homes gained over the next couple of generations wealth from the appreciation of those homes. Two hundred, three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars in wealth. African Americans who were prohibited from feder by federal policy from moving to those suburbs gained none of that wealth. They continued to rent in apartments and in um, uh, uh, public housing or in, in the private market. The white families who gained that wealth used that wealth to send their children to college. They used it to. Um, finance their retirements, to take care of emergencies, and to bequeath funds to their own children who can have down payments for their homes themselves. African Americans, as I said, who are prohibited from participating in this wealth generating policy were able to do none of that. Today, African American incomes on average are 60 percent of white incomes. African American wealth is about 10 percent of white wealth. That enormous disparity that enormous disparity between a 60% income ratio and a 10% wealth ratio is entirely attributable to unconstitutional federal housing policy that was uh, 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 promulgated in the 20th century and that's never been remedied. We could remedy it. We could remedy it by subsidizing African Americans who can afford to buy a home for $100,000 especially with a VA or FHA mortgage, as was done in the 20th century, with no down payment or minimal down payment, but who now can no longer find a home in those neighborhoods for $100,000. We could subsidize them. The federal government could buy up homes in places like Levittown or any of the hundreds of others like this at market rates and resell them to African Americans at a, a reduced rate to try to compensate for that wealth gap that was created. Um, at the low end, we have uh, some programs of the low income housing tax credit, as you probably know, is a tax credit to developers to build rental housing for low income families. It's almost always used to create segregation because those developments are almost always placed in low income, already low income neighborhoods. It's easier to do it. Developers would much rather use their tax subsidies to build uh, housing for low income families in low income neighborhoods because they don't have to hold any community meetings justifying why they're bringing black people into the community. And they don't have to <coughs> um, pay higher land costs in more affluent communities. And they can put up a sign in the window and lots of potential renters will walk by and see the vacancies. They don't have to advertise it. So they'd rather do it. But we could very easily modify that program to create an incentive for developers to place those projects in high opportunity communities where there are good schools and, and fresh food available. And, um, Lots of access to transportation and jobs. The Section 8 pro program, which you're all familiar with, a, a subsidy to families of um, uh, low income to rent apartments is also used mostly to reinforce segregation because those subsidies are used mostly to rent apartments in already low income segregated neighborhoods is, uh, uh, for the same reasons that I just described, the low income housing tax credit being done. So there's no, no shortage of ideas that we could pursue to desegregate this country and to make it possible to close the achievement gap in schools, to close the health and life expectancy gaps in public health, and to create a political, um, and, and with the criminal justice reform, and to create a new political landscape in which we are not engaging in racial um, herit hatred. Um, the, the remedies are easily available. None of them can happen unless we familiarize ourselves with this history and disabuse ourselves of the myth of de facto segregation. And I'm grateful to all of you for sharing that mission with me. So thank you very much. Many of us learned something today. Raise your hand. 
And how many of us are shocked <laughs> to learn about the history of government policy that shaped the way we live? Mr. Rothstein, we're so thankful for your work, for your research, and for you being here with us. The presentation today is so timely, which is the reason why in this 50th year, as we look at where we are in this country, as it relates to the Fair Housing Act of 1968, we want to have you here with us uh, at this particular forum to look at where we are in this country. And I'm so happy to be part of an organization that is effectively working to help solve and move our nation forward. I want to take this time to ask if we have any congressional leaders or any representatives in the audience. Has Congressman Meeks been able to make it into the room yet? If not, we're going to, we're going to uh, go ahead and keep moving forward with the program. At this time, I would like to ask our panelists if you all would make your way to the stage. Uh, As they make their way to the stage, I want to continue to encourage everyone to continue to use your social media to tweet and to text our live stream. Richard Rothstein, he does have his book, The Cut of Law, there in the back of the room. And after our session today, he will be signing those books outside. At this time, I'm going to ask the author of our State of Housing in Black America report, Jim Carr, if he would come up and give us highlights for the report. Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> this year's 2018 State of Housing in Black America takes place in a unique context, and that is the context of the 50th anniversary of the passage of the 1968 Fair Housing Act, uh, which was intended to ameliorate and address many of the problems that have been created by previous discriminatory actions directly by the federal government that Mr. Rothstein talked about, as well as the Kerner Commission report, which I think almost everyone knows the one quote from that report about America becoming two societies. And so as we were writing about the 2018 report, uh, I want to thank uh, Jeffrey Hicks, the president, first of all, for allowing me to write the report again this year. Uh, I wrote the first one in 2013. Uh, and since I'm still writing it, I'm assuming that they must uh, approve of the product. Um, but when we were talking, um, I, I wanted to thank him because he really wanted us to contextualize what's happened as of today in the context of 50 years of struggle. And so as a result, uh, NARAB has produced a second report. We're not going to discuss it uh, at this event because there's just not enough time. But it's called 50 Years of Struggle um, uh, looking at the challenges as well as the successes that have occurred over the five decades since uh, those two events. So first I'm just going to say a couple of words in terms of context. Um, one of the things that's interesting is uh, Mr. Rothstein could have stood here and talked all night long uh, about the different discrimination and its effects on black America. So for example, one of the things that he alluded to, but he didn't state explicitly, is that America is more segregated today than it was in 1920. Well, And that was directly as a result of the programs that were put into place around the late 1930s and then today, which actually require mandated and enforced segregated living. Another thing that's important, and, and we'll look at it in the Sheba statistics to show how despite all of the gentrification we're seeing, segregation remains very high. 
and we'll talk just a little bit about the meaning of that and why it occurs. I think the thing that's important to recognize is that although uh, the Kerner Commission concluded with one really profound recommendation, and they said we need solutions that are at the scale and the magnitude of the problems that were created by federal action. And we've never had that. In fact, we've had quite the opposite. Um, we've had very lackluster um, actions. So if you look at the 1968 Fair Housing Act, this is an act that uh, Lisa Rice, who's on the panel, is uh, our resident expert on everything about the Fair Housing Act. It was passed with practically no enforcement um, mechanisms at all. Basically, if the federal government suspected discrimination, they could ask the discriminator, will you consider um, stopping to discriminate? <laughs> but there was no effective enforcement mechanism at all. And so um, when we're thinking about the housing market, right, we made some gains. In 2004, the black home ownership rate had reached uh, just under 50 percent. Do you know where those gains have gone? We're back to the rate of 1968. We've basically seen all those gains eviscerated. But they didn't just happen to go away. They went away because much of that home ownership rate was built on a foundation of predatory subprime loans. And those loans were unsustainable. Many of them were fraudulent. They were rift with problems. And so it wasn't an accident or, or uh, you know, a lack of anyone's guess that ultimately they were going to fall apart. Now let's look at that federal action. What happened when the foreclosure crisis struck? The subprime loans were the epicenter of the for, uh, foreclosure crisis, largely private label, subprime loans. What loans were eligible for HAMP foreclosure assistance? Fannie, Freddie. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, conventional. So the people who had received the best loans, the lowest uh, interest rate, highest quality loans, got access to the federal government's only meaningful modification program and people say, wow, it's just a shame that blacks lost their homes so much and, you know, their weak financial position, they couldn't hang in there. Well, but they also couldn't access the HEMP program in disproportionate numbers, all right? Today, when blacks try to apply for a loan, they still face discrimination. I guess we might call that de jure or de facto. I'm confused because when federal agencies require the use of credit scores, which they know are not as predictive for people of color, they know this, it's been written about extensively. Alana McCargo's uh, institution is one that has written about this significantly. We know they're not as predictive for people of color and yet they're still mandated within the mortgage market. And that creates greater rejection rates. And it creates even greater rejection rates because many people are never recorded as being rejected because they simply don't apply. Or the lender tells them straight up, don't waste your time filling out paperwork because you won't, you won't receive you know, a loan. Or if you're successful in getting a loan because you have a poor, credit measured, a poor measured credit score, you pay more for interest rates, for points, for fees. This is in our report. We focused on this every year for the last three years in a row. So even if you get the loan, you pay more for the loan, even in the best market, the conventional market, right? But even after you own the home, now it's time to get that appreciation. Except guess what? You don't get the same appreciation. And again, it's not a market activity. It's real estate agents who do not show homes on an equal basis to all borrowers, particularly whites in black neighborhoods, except, and there's a caveat now, except to the extent that neighborhood looks like it's being gentrified and it's going to flip. And in that case, <laughs> Katie barred a door. Right. And finally, where's market innovation? So Mr. Rothstein pointed out, rightfully, that there are lots of different programs the government could invest in, but, but those are subsidized programs. And so the thing I think we need to stay focused on is step one, we don't need subsidized programs. We need accurate credit scores. We need down payment requirements that are not so high that allow financial capacity to serve as the new form of racial discrimination. 
If we've been racially discriminated against such that we don't have the wealth, then how can we all of a sudden have the down payment of 15 to 20 percent? And because we don't have that down payment, when we go for a loan, we detail this in the 2018 report, and I'll go through that very quickly, we then pay almost astronomical amounts of insurance and fees to compensate for the fact we don't have the 20 percent down payment. Is that de facto or de jure? Is that disparate impact? And especially if it's built upon a credit score that is known not to be as predictive for blacks, sounds like there is a problem. So the conclusion of sort of the context for this year's report is simply this, that not only have we not put into place remedies that are as powerful as the negative forces that have driven blacks into this precarious financial state, but we are still having federal policies and actions that further drive us into a financial abyss. And this is one of the reasons why, as Mr. Rothstein pointed out, the uh, gap in wages is, is at 60 percent. It actually grew during the Clinton administration eras to 65 percent, which was good, five percentage points, and then it dropped down to 60 and it's still falling. Wealth disparities, the wealth gap has grown over the last 20 years, and it's still growing. That wage gap is growing. So these problems that we're facing actually are getting worse. So let me just say one thing about home ownership. Did I say we're back to the 1960s? Research by the Urban Institute looking at intergenerational ownership of home ownership suggests, in my view, they don't state this explicitly, but looking at their data suggests that black home ownership is actually on a long-term trend to be even lower today than it is with, than, than lower, to, lower in the future, 10 to 20 years in the future, than it is today. So that's our context. So the final thing to wrap up this context is uh, Mr. Rothstein said we need to change people's minds, and I totally agree about that. Um, and his work I have followed for many, many years, mostly in education, and I find it to be fascinating. But I need to encourage everyone to simply focus on this reality. Changing minds is good, but changing behaviors is essential. And when individuals are acting in an illegal, discriminatory, disparate way that can be challenged in court, step one, challenge the behavior, change the behavior, let the attitudes follow. And with that, I see that uh, Congressman Meeks has shown up, and so I'm going to have a seat now and listen to him, and then I'll come back and rattle through the, the highlight statistics very quickly. We are so grateful, the National Association of Real Estate Brokers is just so grateful to have the opportunity to present this forum at the Congressional Black Caucus. We certainly could not do it without the support of Congressman Gregory Meeks, our congressional sponsor, who graciously supports NARAB's mission to increase the nation's belief in democracy and housing for all of its citizens. In, wedge, in wages, the legislative wars on Capitol Hill to ensure that black home ownership is not overlooked or purposely ignored as laws and policies are promulgated. Congressman Meeks has served in Congress since 1998, representing the citizens of the 6th and 5th District of New York, where he served on the House Financial Services Committee. Please, let us give a warm CBC welcome to Congressman Meeks. <laughs> 
Thank you, Mr. President. Somebody I can call president anyway. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. That's good. <laughs> to all of our distinguished panelists and all of you great, this place has grown. It just shows the importance and the significance of the of NAREB and what we're doing and what you're doing and how significant you are to the United States of America. Let me say right out, because we have with us an individual who I know she's scheduled to speak, but she just whispered in my ear that we have votes coming up shortly. Uh, and, you know, I see some of you all the time when we go up to her event in Martha's Vineyard. And you've been there and supporting her, and we want your continued support because she's my sister uh, and my colleague and one that has been in and on the battlefield. You know, we basically came in at the same time together. We said we've got our own class. We both came in in special elections. I came before her in a special election replacing the Reverend Dr. Floyd H. Flake, and three months later replacing uh, an individual who we just lost and who we all uh, have a heavy heart, but the work that he did, the late, great Ron Dellums. It is my friend and colleague, the one and only Barbara Lee. You know, today we find ourselves in a very peculiar, yet all too familiar place. This year marks two significant milestones. This week makes 10 years since Lehman Brothers failed. Lehman was indeed a canary in the coal mine of what became the greatest recession since the Great Depression. This year also marks 50 years since the passing of the Fair Housing Act, which outlawed discrimination in housing. I can almost remember going back then as a high school graduate going to Tucson, Arizona, and they had set me up with the human rights uh, organization there, and they had me go out with someone that was supposed to have been my parent, because we would see an ad of a house for sale, and we would go out and said, is it for sale? And they said, yes. You know, we had someone that had a different kind of voice and things. So then we would ride out immediately. And when we arrived and they saw it, we looked, they said, oh, it was just sold. Mystery shot. Unfortunately, that still happens in some places today, 50 years later. So both these milestones, the Great Recession and the Fair Housing Act, remind us that progress for black folk in this country is never linear. It remains a continued political process. And although we have come a long way since the Fair Housing Act, research from the Urban Institute demonstrates that black home ownership rates have declined to levels not seen before the Civil Rights era. Much of this decline in black wealth can be attributed to the Great Recession, which we have pulled, we've not pulled ourselves out of yet. Indeed, this month makes the 94th consecutive month of job growth in America, yet black home ownership is not where it was before the recession. So how do we make sense of our community's deferred dreams of home ownership in an era of so-called economic strength? Adapting from Langston Hughes, I ask, what should happen to a dream deferred? What I would impress upon you today, as you will find, that started in your conference packages 
is that the dream still demands our courage, our leadership, and our resilience. But most importantly, the dream still demands legislation, good public policy, and political engagement. And although we celebrate 50 years of the Fair Housing Act, we must remember that the law's enactment was an exercise of compromise and horse trading, mostly in the Senate where Southern politicians filibustered the law. Like every other major piece of legislation, the Fair Housing Act was, was an incomplete law that included imperfect provisions necessary to attract imperfect allies. In other words, the Fair Housing Act was only the beginning of our efforts to ensure equal housing and social economic integration, but it was never intended to be a solution in and of itself, and the authors understood this. Now, I don't want anybody to get mad, but my fraternity brother, you know that fraternity that started them all, is known as Alpha Phi Alpha. <laughs> former U.S. Senator Ed Brooke. He was the deal maker behind the law's eventual passage. In Senator Brooke's mind, ending housing discrimination was not only housing policy, but it was also education policy and workforce policy. And in his mind, easing the ills of poor schools and poor jobs could only be addressed by first eliminating housing discrimination. If you don't have some place to live, if you don't have a roof over your head, it's difficult for you to learn or to do anything else. And so he saw it as making sure that someone had a roof over their head. And so despite putting forward a comprehensive bill, Senator Brooke could only get support from a hostile Senate and a tepid President Johnson. And so he moved forward with a watered-down version of the Fair Housing Act that only covered 80% of the market. And in his memoir, Senator Brooks stated that the Fair Housing Act was, and I quote, an important achievement, achievement, yet the housing bill was far from perfect. He would on to state that, worst of all, the bill's enforcement powers are weak, and the battle to push them went on for years. So let me just say, it tells you where we are today and why, despite the legislation that was passed, we can never take anything for granted. And if you see that the gap, the wealth gap that is happening, because as the country is allegedly recovered, there is still this huge gap between those of us who are of a color and others and even in the values of our homes. But yet, it is still in that home. It is still trying to understand and legislate so that no one gets tricked in, into the kind of mortgages that they received back in 08. It is still in that home is what we can rebuild that wealth that's necessary so that a person like me can eventually become elected to the United States House of Representatives. It is that home. That home. So we have now just as an important of job to make sure that we go out to educate our folks, to tell them don't give up, persevere, that we've got to push on, that you still need. I'm telling my daughter, my daughter right now, this is what we got to do. My daughter is eight and a half months pregnant. And they were trying to figure out, they've been renting her and her husband, renting a house. I said, no, you got to buy a house. You got to buy a house now. Thank you. So that your child has some place to grow up and you can get some equity. And I said, even if it means that you have to live in my house to save the money that you need to pay for your down payment to buy your house, that's what has to happen. Thank you. So they've been in my house for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> and then I saw her the other day, and she had a little, my son-in-law come run up to me and said, did you speak to Ebony yet? 
And I said, no, I haven't spoken to her. I said, what's going on? Because I was worried, I'm thinking maybe something's wrong with her pregnancy or something of that nature. She said, well, go speak to her. And so I went to speak to her and she says, dad, we closed on a house today. <laughs> And I got to tell you, the realtor and the person they utilized look like the people in this room. <laughs> and it gets to be contagious because now that she did that, my second daughter came to me and says, Dad, I need that realtor because now I want to buy something. <laughs> so I end by saying this. We need you. We need you now and our future needs you. And it is dependent upon who and where we will be going as a folk and what kind of wealth and money creation we have. Because it is still the basic and most important and probably the biggest investment that people of color will make in their lifetime. And those of us who are in Congress, we learned our mistakes, so we're gonna fix it so that, that doesn't ever happen again. But we're gonna keep and stay on your side until we can look up and see that we have finally made equality and eliminated the wealth gap for folks. My brothers and sisters, Dr. King said, where do we go from here? Community or chaos? We go to community, and community means creating wealth. Creating wealth means buying and owning a home, and you are the ones that will lead the way. Thank you, and may God continue to bless each and every one of you. Enjoy this. Congressional Black Caucus Meeks. Congressman Meeks sounds like a realtor, doesn't he? <laughs> We're going to dive right into our questions for our panelists and talk about solutions. I want to start with Elena. Elena DeCargo. Elena, we have heard Rothstein's historical perspective on Federal Housing Administration, FHA, intentional and unconstitutional practices that underpin the discrimination and separation that essentially propped up white home ownership and wealth building stability over the last 50 years. How important my question is, how important is the FHA and VA for black home ownership in the current context of what policies, products, and practices in the modern housing finance system? And how the modern housing finance system could help move the dial in reducing the black home ownership gap and simultaneously reduce the overall wealth gap? Good afternoon. Thank you, Jeffrey, for uh, the invitation to be here and for all of you. Um, uh, this has been a great day already um, and a great panel. Um, I am Elena McCargo with the Urban Institute. I know the introductions happen, but you know I want to let you know that um, we're a research institute. So a lot of the data you've heard reference to some of the work we've done, um, where we you know we are focused on the social and economic policy issues that are underlying um, the fabric, and I specifically work on the housing finance system uh, and, the, and the systems that are um, kind of underlying everything that Richard Rothstein and, um, and, J and Jim and others um, have been talking about today. In, in direct response to your question, and I have a few slides, I think they'll start to move along here. Um, it's interesting to have my first, um, I'll see if we can transition. Um, Actually, why don't we just move past this? I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, you know, Richard Rothstein uh, shared the history of the, of the Federal Housing Administration, or FHA, and the role that it played, the critical role that it played in isolating, segregating, and essentially discriminating against blacks, um, and the ability for, um, for blacks to obtain home ownership. Uh, I think that history is so important because when you look at the title of my first slide, it says the Federal Housing Administration and the Veterans Administration, two government agencies, play a disproportionately important role today in serving minority communities 
uh, and making them and helping them to become homeowners. And in today's market, I mean, there's a lot of things that happened in between uh, the history that he shared and where we are today. In today's market, um, the federal the federal government plays an outsized role. And you can see from the from the couple of um, charts that I have up here, the um, the FHA and the Veterans Administration both uh, disproportionately serve. Um, black and Hispanic families. At the bottom, you can see the proportion um, exactly for the FHA-insured loans. 45% of all loans made uh, to blacks in this country are FHA loans, 44% uh, for Hispanics. Um, and then you can see the, the rest of the dimensions. The other thing I'll point out is conventional. We talk about a system um, that has um, the GSEs, who are big conventional players, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Uh, we heard a little bit about them in Jim's comments. They are not serving black and Hispanic communities as aggressively as the government agencies are today. Uh, and I think it's really important that we listen and think about the housing finance reforms that need to be made and ensure that we are thinking about the critical role in the future that the Federal Housing Administration, the Veterans Administration, and the GSEs play in serving communities of color. Uh, I'm going to, to just add a little bit more context, I mean, the FHA uh, has many inefficiencies in it today. While it is doing service, there are a lot of things happening in that system that are broken, that are old uh, and antiquated. Um, a lot of traditional banks are not doing FHA lending, so we're finding non-banks and other institutions serving communities of color to be able to offer them FHA loans, while those non-banks are doing a a good job, they are keeping FHA lending available in the communities, we have to think about why is that and what are the problems in the system that are creating that dynamic. Um, the, the FHA, the agency, has a lot of work to do in terms of um, modernizing its technology and ensuring that the financial health of its underlying insurance program is strong, and those are fundamental things in the system, the overall system, that need to be uh, top of mind as legislators think about housing policy and housing finance reforms of the future that will serve everyone equally. Um, I'm going to turn to the next, um, next slide just to really talk a little bit more about non-banks. I mentioned a little bit earlier that traditional banks are pulling back from FHA lending, and it's important to note that non-bank lenders have really stepped in to fill this gap. I think there's enough data now to call this a trend. If you look at this, um, at the top left, it just shows you the share of um, bank, non-bank total purchase originations. Non-banks produce more loans in this country for everyone <laughs> um, uh, in 2016 and 17 than traditional banks did. And if you look to the right, you can see the share of government originations that um, non-banks are doing. The, gov the government originations are in yellow. So that just gives you a sense of how much more lending they're doing in the government space. Uh, at the bottom left chart is the share of originations to blacks between banks and non-banks. I took this, I think this was a really important piece to look at, um, and you can see again a growing trend. Blacks are being served um, disproportionately more than, um, uh, by non-banks than, than traditional banks. And in the bottom right, I just put that chart in, it's a FICO chart, it's very difficult to read it, but I, I, we look at all the dimensions of credit that are important for people to be able to access, that is your credit score, that is your income, what your debt is, et cetera we see the non-banks going deeper into the credit box to serve people of color, low-income low people, and ensure um, that, that those loans are being made. So um, while there has been a lot of talk about, um, about the, the system as a, at, as a whole, we have to recognize this. And we have to ask the question, why is this happening? And do we have the right regulations, policies, and practices in place for the non-bank space? Um, as we move forward, given the dominant role that they are playing in serving uh, the African American and um, Hispanic populations. Um, so, thank you. Thank you. A long thank answer you. to your good question. Thank you, Elena. <laughs> Thanks. And Maurice, I want to continue this solutions conversation with you. What ideas and solutions can you offer to advance black home ownership? Well, first of all, thank you, Jeffrey, for, and NARAB for inviting me to sit on this stage again. I've had an opportunity to do this a number of times. Um, I've got a slide deck that has a lot of data 
that actually supports everything that Alana said with more specific data. But more importantly, what I want to talk about is this. A month from now, the Mortgage Bankers Association will have their convention right in this room, right in this convention. The complexion of this room will be a polar opposite of what it is right now. The industry is still, and I get on the stage at the Mortgage Bankers and I'll have this statement, that is a sea of salt and a few specks of pepper. So while the mortgage banks are serving the needs of the black community to the point of 60% in 2017, you add to that the banks with greater than 10 billion in assets, it's 82%. So all the other banks, credit unions, OCC regulated institutions, Federal Reserve, FDIC, make up the difference. It's important for us to know from a, a, a term that's used in the industry, it's called best execution. If I'm a lender, what am I gonna do with this loan? Am I gonna put it in portfolio? Am I gonna sell it? If so, who am I gonna sell it to? Am I gonna sell it to Fannie and Freddie? Am I gonna sell it to HUD? Or have HUD insured? HUD doesn't buy loans, nor does Fannie and Freddie. Lenders make the loans. Now, first thing that we can do is look under the hood of what lenders are doing in your neighborhood. We have a site, it's free, called LendingPatternsLight.com. All one word, dot com, LendingPatternsLight. Go there, register, you can look at any lender in the United States for their data over the last three to four years to see what the complexion is of the loans they made in your area, including by congressional districts. Now, with that, you have the power to begin having conversations with the lenders in your neighborhood. Not just the mortgage companies, but the banks as well. Now, I'm gonna skip ahead to, 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 to some solutions, because that was your primary question. The primary question is, if you are renting today, and you wanna own your own home, get your financial house in order. Begin to save some money, and begin to prepare yourselves for home ownership. If you own a home today, make home ownership a major discussion and conversation at your dinner table with your family and friends, just like what Congressman McMeek said. Now, to close this gap, we need to diversify the lending industry. We need many of you to begin to apply to work and own in that industry. The lack of diversity has its major disadvantages, one, because people like to do business with people that look like them. So if you have a, an audience that is predominantly white, they're gonna go and gravitate, not necessarily because of demonstra uh, discrimination, but that's, all, that's who they know, okay? Now, to the black realtors in the room, it's time for many of you to step up and become lenders as well. Many of you are, but it's time, it is time. I know, of, and one of the things that's different about my company is that we straddle the fence. We are serving everybody. I know today that there are a number of lenders who want to make more loans to black people, but really don't have the resources or the, the ideas of how to do that. And so we've got to take it to them. We've got to put the pressure on to say, here, here's a loan that qualifies. Make this loan. Make this loan. Now, to the policy wonks in this room, We've got to continue to put pressure on Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, the Federal Housing Finance Agency to ensure that they are using our taxpayer dollars to serve all Americans. Today, that is not happening. The 14-year history of the share of loans that were bought by Fannie and Freddie from black people, this is going to scare you. Fannie Mae, 4.28% of the loans that they have bought were from black people. Freddie Mac, over the last 14 years, that number is 3.45%. It's even worse. And so while we have been blamed for the demise of those agencies, it's impossible for that to have been the case. They don't own enough loans that came from us. The HARP program, the HAMP program that Jim spoke about, those are, in effect, white affirmative action. That's an effect of what is happening. Now, here is the most solid thing that I'm about to say as a solution. There is a provision in the, uh, in the COA, the Economic 
the, the, the um, I'm missing a drawing my, my, my mirth, so I'm getting so excited about this. <laughs> <laughs> but the economic, the, the, uh, ECOA, yeah. the ECOA, I'll tell you what it means in a second. But there's a provision in it called a special purpose credit program. Mm -hmm. It can be sponsored by a nonprofit or a for-profit institution. It is designed specifically to allow for that program to have credit made to underserved groups. It can be defined by many different ways, whether it be race, gender, et cetera. And on the gender part, one of the other issues in our community, 71% of the loans made in 2017 went to single women or single men with no co -applicant. If you've got one income on that application, it's going to be a little tougher. Not impossible, but tougher. And so this special purpose credit program, I, in, I, I totally encourage, and I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, the National Association of Black Real Estate Brokers to begin to form a special credit purpose program to begin to leverage the law to make credit available to the people you want to sell homes to. It is available. We can make this happen. We can make this happen. So a, a bottom line to close, to close this homeowner gap, home ownership gap, it must be intentional. It, it will not happen by accident. So otherwise, the next 50 years after the Fair Housing Act, we will continue to be exactly where we are right now. A dual mortgage market that is separate, one white, one black, separate and unequal. That's what we're dealing with. So we got to step up, bottom line. Thank you. Thank you, Maurice. So as, as the kids say, drop, drop the mic. Drop the mic. Lisa. Lisa Rice. Our room today is filled with real estate professionals. How can they be a part of the solution to help advance fair and equal housing opportunities in black homeownership? Um, I want to also echo the sentiments of my colleagues and thank you, Narab, for first, first hosting this forum and, and engaging in this robust conversation about uh, the challenges and the solutions for expanding African American homeownership in America. Um, one of the things, in answer to your question, um, Jeffrey, is that we really need the real estate agent the real estate professionals in the room to help us enforce the Fair Housing Act. And that's all I'm going to talk about. Because it is enforcement of the Fair Housing Act that is going to tear down and strip away the barriers to fair and equal housing and credit access and allow us the mechanisms to start gaining and achieving wealth in America. And real estate professionals can be a viable active player in the effort to enforce the Federal Fair Housing Act. And I'll share with you two ways, two things that we really need you to do. Um, Richard talked about the fact that when the Fair Housing Act was first passed, there was a little teeth to the law. Well, that changed 30 years ago today. Today marks the 30th anniversary of the Fair Housing Amendments Act, which not only added additional protection, uh, protected classes to the act, but it significantly strengthened the enforcement mechanisms under the Fair Housing Act. And now this law is a powerful tool and asset that we have. And real estate agents can help us by identifying and sharing with us the barriers to fair housing that you see. And I don't think that you realize how important of a player you are in this, in this effort. So let me explain. Over half of the fair lending cases that I have brought throughout the course of my 35-year career have been brought to me by real estate agents who recognize that their clients were facing discrimination in the real estate community, in the insurance community, and in the homeowners and, uh, uh, community, and in the lending community. Williams versus Countrywide, a precedent-setting case, 
in which countrywide mortgage discriminated against an African-American couple by telling them that because Mrs. Williams was pregnant, the couple could not close on their loan. Their real estate agent, who was a realtist, Mr. Clark in Ohio, brought us the case, and we effectively litigated that case and established a precedent expanding opportunities not just for his client, but for thousands of women across the country. So please connect with your local fair housing organizations. Um, I was just talking to Antoine Thompson. He and I have committed, we're going to be doing some collaborative efforts at the national effort, at the national level, that we want you all to pattern at the local uh, level and in your local communities so that we can engage more between the real estate community and the fair housing community to identify fair housing violations and then to bring them. The second thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to actively engage in the fair housing planning process. Every five years, this is a federal requirement, in order for your local jurisdiction, cities and states, to get federal funds from HUD, they have got to engage in what is called the affirmatively furthering fair housing planning process. This happens every five years. And this process, what, in, in this process, what is supposed to happen is you're supposed to identify the barriers to fair housing, A, and then B, develop solutions to address and overcome those barriers to fair housing. And we need real estate professionals to actively engage with us, commit your time and your effort. That's all we need is your time, your effort, your energy, your brain, your intellect. That's all we need. Actively engage with us in that fair housing planning process on the ground so that we can expand equal and fair housing opportunities. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Alston, the 2018 Sheba report focused extensively on excessive pricing of loans to black borrowers. Could you explain loan level price adjustments and provide us an, with an example at the borrower level on how pricing at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac works? Yes. Um, loan level price adjustments. I'm laughing because I see my friends from Fannie Mae and FHFA leaving me. I'm getting ready to talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> Megan and Danielle, good afternoon. <laughs> in, in, in 2008, the American taxpayer, me and you, we bailed out Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to $188 billion. We made them a loan. Now, to their credit, they paid that loan back, all $188 billion, and they made an additional $60 billion, and the government has taken all of that in a treasury sweep and applied it to the deficit. This is housing money. The fair, the, the loan level price adjustments, I call them the poor pay more fee adjustment. What that means is if you have a lower FICO score or you put less money down, that you pay more for your loan and get a higher interest rate. Since 64% of white people have a credit score over 700 and only 33% of black people have a credit score over 700, that it has a disparate impact on people of color and the people who are least able to afford the difference in pricing. So the people who have the least amount of money because you make the least amount, the people who have only either 5% or 8% of the wealth of white people, depending on what report you look at, have least money to put down so you pay more. Mm. Let me give you an example. If you have a 639 FICO score well within the credit box of 620 and you're approvable, it used to be if you were approvable, you got the same interest rate and the same pricing no matter what. Prior, this started in April 2008. 
If you buy a house at $225,000, about the national average, you put 5% down. Please don't go too fast. I need you to back up. Yeah. That's why I've come. <laughs> you have, if, you have, if you have a 639 FICO score and you put 5% down, you have a 3 and a quarter percent uh, uh, price adjustment, loan level price adjustment, poor pay more fee adjustment. That means you have to add $6,946 to your closing costs. Now, you're only putting 5% down. You don't have enough money to begin with. So you can't afford to put this additional money in closing costs. So what do we do? We raise the interest rate to provide a higher yield. That way we can close you with the money that you have. So today, if you're at four and a quarter percent, that, that, that if you were able to have a 740 FICO score, you'd be at four and a quarter percent. You'd have a payment of $1,051 on that loan amount. But because you have the three and a quarter percent adjustment to the cost, we have to raise the interest rate to cover that cost. So now you pay $1,180. Over the year you pay, next slide. Over the year you pay $3,864 more. And over the life of that loan, you pay $46,000. $371 more than a person with a lower FICO score. Mm. The, the problem is, is that Fannie and Freddie are now profitable. When they were in trouble and they needed help, that was okay. But their charter was to facilitate mortgage financing for average Americans, and HERA requires that they provide financing, including lower than market interest rates and other innovative products to low to moderate income borrowers. This is unfair, needs to change, and needs to be a focus. Professor Carr. Mr. Professor Carr, Mr. Rothstein's work shows institutional discrimination, much of it mandated by public laws, barred homeownership to blacks, but discrimination has long been over, yet the black homeownership rate is back to where it was in 1968, at a time when discrimination was legal. <laughs> Can you, can you please explain how institutional bias continues to hamper black homeownership today? Sure, so um, thank you for the question. I, I'm gonna build on something that Mark just said, looking at his example slightly different. Um, one that we wrote about in the report is a borrower who has a 660 credit score, significantly higher, a 5% down payment on a $200 home, they would end up paying loan level price adjusters of $4,275, plus uh, they'd have to purchase private mortgage insurance, that would add up to another 57,000, and then add that to their 10%, uh, their 5% uh, down payment, which is $10,000, and effectively they're paying for effectively coverage of $67,000 on a $200,000 home. That's an LTV basically of 67%. Looked at another way, if you translate that into a default uh, rate, um, that assumes a default rate of about 24%, which is three times higher than the worst performing loans at the time of the financial crisis experienced by either, uh, well, by Fannie Mae, that one I know because they studied that. Um, and that was at a period when the unemployment rate was 10%, uh, right? And the entire housing market was collapsing homes were upside down by 30%. So the question is, why is the pricing so high? And the pricing is so high because, uh, as Mark alluded to, the institutions are still held in conservatorship. And so they have no real flexibility. Basically, those, those fees are structured as deficit reduction tools, and that's why they're not coming down. In fact, to the credit of both Fannie and Freddie, they actually started reducing their uh, loan level pricing fees. And NARAB, I think, can take some credit for that because that was one of your principal objectives. And they actually started doing that. And FHFA put the, uh, put the brakes on that and established a minimum floor. Even though there's absolutely no justification that's been made public of why that minimum floor is necessary, given the fact that both Fannie and Freddie have the best books of business, arguably, in the history of both institutions. Mm. This is important because blacks don't have the financial endowments. 
So if we could have paid for coverage of a 20% down payment, we could avoid all the rest of the excessive payments that Mark talked about or I did in my borrower group. And one other thing. So we've talked about the fact that blacks really rely on FHA. Here's an important point. Since 2004, when black home ownership was its highest, right, and we were disproportionately already going to subprime loans, um, black, uh, the, the, the share of blacks going for conventional mortgages has dropped between 2004 to 2016 by a full 74%. So applications by 74%, originations by 64%. The question is this, why are blacks not applying for conventional loans? Because we can't get them unless we apply. Could it have something to do with steering in the real estate market, which is another institutional uh, form of discrimination? We know that we have independent mortgage brokers. We saw from Alana's slide that independent mortgage brokers tend to focus more on FHA, and they also tend to focus disproportionately on African Americans, or at least African Americans are going to independent mortgage brokers. Like, which one came first, chicken or egg? That's the right. fact is that there is still steering in the market, and until we get that out of the market, blacks will continue to go to FHA when they could have gotten potentially better deals at Fannie and Freddie. So we could continue this conversation over and over. It's in every aspect of the mortgage finance business. And it's really incumbent upon us when we're looking for solutions to really help legislators, regulators, and others focus on the fact that these institutional biases are the first thing that need to go. We don't need special programs. And it's one of the things that most concerns me when I hear people talking about trying to improve black home ownership. And the first step is, here's the way we can create a subsidy. We don't need to create a subsidy. We need to remove discriminatory biases and institutional biases. Whether they would be considered legal or not, they are wrong because they build on the, um, on the discriminatory infrastructure that put black people in an inferior economic position. And then the bar says, now you have to be able to reach this high post, which of course we can't meet. And if not, that's called market activity, and it's not. And the last thing I'll say is about mortgage innovation. Both Fannie and Freddie actually are trying to do mortgage innovation. I know this personally by talking to members of the staff. They can't do it because they don't have a portfolio, and one of the challenges they have in conservatorship is that they can't reserve for losses. So they can't afford to any tolerance for any losses, and they can't pilot programs. There are programs that for example, would completely remove the need for a credit score and a down payment, called lease purchase mortgages. But we can't pilot or innovate that because we don't have an innovating housing financial uh, system. We need to get Fannie and Freddie out of conservatorship and put them back in the business of actually meeting the credit needs of all Americans, not just middle to high income non-Hispanic whites. In white neighborhoods. In white neighborhoods. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they're in black neighborhoods in a lot of places now, but they're not serving yeah, no. blacks in those neighborhoods. Yeah, no. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Thank you. <laughs> Elena, Elena, I would like to come back to you. At the Urban Institute, you've done significant research on the black homeownership gap. What would you say is the largest barrier to becoming a homeowner for blacks? Well, as you've all heard today, there are many barriers um, in the way many of them systemic in nature, many of them rooted in um, a lot of the history we heard about earlier. Uh, I think the biggest barriers that, um, that, that blacks face are those that are sort of baked in to the housing finance system today and that have come about from a, a lot of it, from extreme regulation and response to the crisis um, that happened in 2008 that is really hurting the recovery since that crisis um, for black families. Um, there's a chart I have um, here that just shows you 20 years um, of historical context, just to give you a um, snapshot of, 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 um, of what has happened over 20 years. Um, this essentially shows you from 1998 to today how much risk the mortgage market is taking overall. 
Um, and you can see today, which is at the far right, is much lower. Uh, we're, not, we're not taking anywhere near the levels of risk that we were taking, uh, let's just say, in the, in the um, early 2000s. There's a little section there. 2001, 2002, we consider that a period of reasonable lending standards, meaning we looked at credit scores, debt to income ratios, loan to value. Uh, those loans perform very well through the crisis. Um, even the ones made, you know, all, all loans performed very well that were originated during that period. It's that run up to that crisis where the subprime lending was happening um, uh, disproportionately um, uh, in the, um, the African American and Hispanic communities. Uh, and we can see um, today that there is just simply um, a lot more opportunity to still safely expand the credit box um, and, and lend to more people if we use reasonable standards. So access to credit is still tight. I know we hear on the edges about you know, dangerous lending practices coming back, and um, that is, I, I believe we need to really look at the facts in terms of how um, lending is being done today and who is getting loans. If you do not have pristine credit scores, you will not get a GSE loan. You barely can get an FHA or VA loan. So it's really important to um, to ensure that, that we open that box, dig deeper, and look at the performance of those loans and see the market, see the government, and see the GSEs open up their appetite to take, take on the risk they were taking before for loans that are perfectly high credit quality loans uh, and, and, and be able to move forward. And I think Jim said it so eloquently, we don't need new products, let's just use what we have and expand the opportunity to, uh, to, more, um, to more individuals. Um, in addition, I just want to say one more thing. Um, the, 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 if we could allow the use of, of um, alternative data in mortgage underwriting, for example, on the right there, I just kind of talked about some of the factors that are limiting access today. Um, we would heard about credit scoring a little bit. That's such an important piece um, in the underwriting process and your ability to get a loan. But including things like rental payment history, that's not really considered today. And we have done studies that prove that people who pay their rent, which is a lot of minority people, majority of minorities are using our renters, um, people who are paying rent and pay their rent on time, it shows that they, if they got a mortgage, they are highly likely to pay that mortgage on time. So their risk levels may not be, but we're not using that data consistently and as on a standard basis. And that's a, that's a setback that we can really, um, I think we could advance that would be a solution that could be helpful. So expanding the credit box um, in that way. A, a more thoughtful approach to recognizing the realities of income variability uh, and a greater focus on um, consumer education. I talk about income variability because we know where wages are. Wages have been stagnant. Um, people are making money in lots of different ways. Not everybody has, as we did in the past, just one job, one salary making. We're, we're seeing income come in a lot of ways. A lot of places don't consider that. Uh, and that is, a de that is harmful to African American and Hispanics that are working in variable income jobs that need to use that income to be qualified for a mortgage. So we need to think about ways um, such as that to expand the, to expand the credit box. Um, and so I'll just, I'll pause there and just say, I think that the opportunities um, to uh, expand are there for us to look at the data now exists for us to understand what happened in the past, uh, we need to start applying it. It's time for the policy change. It's time to open up, open up the box and to bring more people into the fold so that we can see more lending, particularly from the GSEs in the minority community. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. That's some great music next door, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I almost wish we were over there. <laughs> Mr. Rothstein, you've heard a lot of comments um, today after your presentation. If you listen to our panelists, are there any more thoughts you would like to share in terms of information that our panelists have shared in, in your research? Well, Jeffrey, you know, I'm, I'm not a housing expert. I'm learning from listening to your panel. I, I'm a historian, and uh, I dabble a little bit in public policy. Um, I guess all I can add is that um, 
the technical stuff has to rest on a political basis. And um, we need allies. Uh, we can't uh, progress in this area without a biracial movement, a uh, new civil rights movement, which has always been biracial. And uh, we need a bully pulpit of politicians like the members of the Congressional Black Caucus, but others as well. You know, I'm very encouraged. I do want to say this. I'm very, very encouraged um, uh, today. I understand, and we all understand, that the, the President of the United States has been empowering a white supremacist movement. But in reaction to that, there's the budding of a new civil rights movement. Uh, you know, there's uh, white politicians like Mitch Landrieu in New, in, in, uh, New Orleans who's removing statues that commemorate slavery. Uh, the, um, five years ago, five years ago, that was inconceivable. Mm. It was inconceivable that a white elected politician in the South would be engaged in an activity like that. We have the Black Lives Matter movement uh, that's um, organizing young people uh, to do something along these lines. Uh, we have not just the, the, the astounding attention that my book has gotten, but ta Coates and Hannah Nicole Jones and um, others like uh, the uh, uh, Evicted, the book by Matthew Desmond. Mm. There is an awakening, and I think that um, in order to make progress in the areas that the panel has talked about, we need a political awakening as well to support that because technicians are wonderful and uh, we rely upon them. But uh, without a political movement, it can't happen. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged that there are these great ideas of things we should do, but I'm also encouraged that there are people mobilizing to make it happen. All right. Thank you so much. Mark, as a black real estate professional, could you just please share with everyone why you feel so passionate <laughs> about the need to increase home ownership in the black community and why it's so important. Yes, first let me say to uh, those members from FHFA that we need people like you on the inside so that when we put pressure from the outside, you can work. And I appreciate you because uh, I put them on the spot. Blacks were, and I talk black specifically, I'm not diverse. Um, we were damaged. We were damaged, and we were damaged more than anyone else. Property who uh, att attains and aspires to own property. Um, intentional policies, government policies, traditional historical policies that have kept us from being able to buy and attain wealth. The idea, the, the, the intrinsic idea that because of the color of my skin, I'm less than you, I'm less smart than you, I don't deserve anything better than you. The wealth building is a great part of this. The, the wealth building is important. It, 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 it's major to be able to, I started my business with a refinance from home ownership. 18, 19 years ago. The wealth building is important, but what's even more important is the self-esteem that comes from owning a house, to planting your roots in the ground, to having your kids go to one school, and, and, and to being able to attend the church of your choice in your community, to create stable, secure communities where you know your neighbors and your kids can run up and down the street. That's what home ownership means to me. I was raised in an apartment. I know what it likes to go to a different school every year. I know what it likes not to know what it's like not to have lifelong friends. I aspire to be a homeowner. I've always wanted to have that for me and my kids. It's what we deserve. It's what we need. It's what realtists stand for. It's who we are. Thank 
There's only uh, passionate person number two, and that would be our good friend Maurice Jordan Earl. Can you ex expound on or add to what Mark just shared and what? explain how race and, and income matter? Just how race and income matter in home and mortgage lending. Well, Jeffrey, thanks for that question. Um, I've recently con con concluded a deck, of, a deck of study on race and income. And the study concludes that low and moderate income whites had better outcomes in lending than middle and upper income blacks, which kind of defies Say life. that again one more time. Put. That low and moderate income white people had better lending outcomes with regards to originations, denials, and fallout than middle and upper income black people. The data supports this That's over right. the last 14 years. So in other words, it's not a blip. <coughs> it's a trend. Now, that trend when you put it in the context of your question, essentially says that there is still something happening underneath the hood of lending. Whether it be discrimination, whether it be differential treatment, whether it be different policies of how they're enacted, the outcomes are different. And so what that raises is the need and the continued need for enforcement that lenders are subject to exams from their regulator. Lenders are beginning to do more work in terms of monitoring. But the fact that this is the outcome today, when low and moderate income white people have better outcomes than middle and upper income blacks, something's wrong with that picture. We've got to dig deeper to understand what are the dynamics there. It can't be income if income is a barrier. The only logical thing I can think of that might be that is if all white people live in rural areas where cost of living was lower, and that might give to a, a higher level of approval, and black people live in mostly urban areas and cost of living is higher, and maybe that might be contributing. That's the only logical thing. And I've got really smart people behind me. I'm not one of those smart people. Uh, I, I own a business that's for profit. And so we do this work for profit, OK? We've got software um, to help lenders and regulators and community organizations use this data to understand what the lending patterns are and what lenders and regulators and us can do to change it. It's not just income. Thank you. Thank you, Maurice. <laughs> just in case some of you all are unaware, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus is taking place at the same time. Mm. And Lisa? You spoke yesterday at the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. And you talked about something about head rights. Could you explain head rights? Sure, certainly. Um, so it's been the case throughout the entire history of the United States that the government has supported our housing finance system or our housing system. So when the United States was first being colonized, the British government established something called the head rights system in which white men received 50 acres of land for every person in their household, um, and that included slaves. So if you had 50 slaves, you got 50 acres per slave that you owned. Um, and this was a system, this head rights system benefited white men primarily. There were a few cases where women did benefit, but it primarily benefited white men. 
The thing that I think is so critical for us to understand is that this head right system didn't come free. It came at great cost to both uh, indigenous people from whom that land was taken uh, to give to those white men, but it also came at the expense of the taxpayer, so the everyday working person who had to pay taxes to fund a militia who then went and forcibly took that land from indigenous peoples to transfer wealth to those white men. That head rights system after the Revolutionary War morphed into what we call, we, we know as the homestead program, the, the land grant program. Again, this is a system where people, primarily white people, were given land, again, that was taken from indigenous uh, uh, Americans, taken from them. That homestead and that land grant system, again, was supported by a militia that was funded by taxpayers that was made available through the, the hard work and the sweat of enslaved populations who oftentimes had to go out and clear the land and so forth and so on. That that land grant and that Homestead Act system morphed into the FHA program, which you heard Richard Rothstein talk about. So the point that I want to make, it's so critical for us to understand, is that throughout the entire history of America, the federal government has supported land and home ownership when it primarily benefited white people. Mm -hmm. Now that we have a great demographic change in our society, and these programs uh, that we have on the books now would benefit people of color, all of a sudden now home ownership is not a good thing. We shouldn't be supporting home ownership. The federal government needs to get out of the home ownership business and we need to completely privatize the secondary housing finance market. We need to obliterate Fannie and Freddie and turn it over to the private market. Now, this is happening at a time simultaneously when the Federal Housing Finance Agency, and I don't mean to beat up on them more, hmm. um, but is supporting policies put in place primarily by Fannie Mae that provide huge amounts of capital for the private market, venture capitalists like BlackRock, to buy up single family homes while they simultaneously are implementing policies that Mark uh, described that prohibit you from being able to buy those single family loans. And renting them out. And renting them out, renting them out and to us right. at a high rate. Uh, and these are same, and, and, and also at a time when institutions like Fannie Mae engaged in discriminatory practices in which they did not maintain the foreclosed houses, the REO inventory in their black communities, in black communities, but they did maintain homes REO in the REO inventory in predominantly white communities. This whole system is messed up. And we need to blow it up. It needs to be overhauled. And it needs to be changed and amended so that it is supporting the ability of everyday hardworking families, like those families that you serve every day, to be able to take part in the American dream. Mm -hmm. Speak to it. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> Drop the mic. <laughs> now that's dropping the mic. Lisa, your remarks is going to lead me to a question I want to ask Richard. Uh, and I'm going to ask you this question in front of this group which was the question I asked you the first time I heard you speak at Georgia State Law School. And I asked him the question, why? Why in this country do we have an issue with race and segregated neighborhoods in America? In your I think you shared with me last night, you were first arrested in 63. So you've been on the battlefield a long time in civil rights. Why do we have this problem in this country? 
We have this problem because this country has never enforced the 13th Amendment. We've never really <laughs> abolished <laughs> slavery and what later came to be called the badges and incidents of slavery. The, the 13th Amendment was adopted right after the Civil War. It had two clauses in it. One was um, the abolition of slavery. The second was a requirement that Congress enforce it by, in effect, uh, I'm, I'm using my words now, not the amendment words, abolishing second-class citizenship. And it began during Reconstruction. You, many of you, I think, know this history. It began in Reconstruction, and the federal government was doing it. And then in 1876, um, a deal was made between the Republican and Democratic parties in which the Democrats, which were a segregationist party, agreed to give the Republicans the presidency in return for the Republicans withdrawing troops from the South and stopping protecting the rights of African Americans. And a period then, which we call Jim Crow, uh, then began, and we forgot, we never fulfilled the promise of the 13th Amendment. In 1868, a law was passed we call the 1968 law the Fair Housing Act. A law was passed abolishing discrimination in housing. The Civil Rights Act, so I think it was 1868, in the, late, in the mid 1860s. Um, it was the Civil Rights Act. And the Supreme Court refused to enforce it. A few weeks within the passage of the 1968 Housing Act, the Supreme Court suddenly said, oh, we were wrong 100 years ago. We should have enforced the Civil Rights Act that prohibited discrimination of housing back 100 years ago. And in that intervening 100 years, uh, we rolled back the rights that had been initially granted by the 13th Amendment. Let me give you one other example of how this happened, and, and uh, so you'll appreciate the, the way in which um, we rolled back. And, and we had made a lot of progress after the Civil War in terms of um, granting African Americans uh, equal rights. The Federal Service, for example, was integrated uh, in, as it grew in the early 20th century. Uh, uh, Presidents McKinley and Teddy Roosevelt and William Howard Taft hired a lot of African Americans in the Federal Service. There were African Americans who were supervising whites in the Federal Service. It wasn't uncommon. In 1912, Woodrow Wilson was elected president. Uh, he was the first Southerner to be elected president after the Civil War. He, he'd moved to New Jersey, but he wasn't a northerner. He was southern segregationist. And he imposed a policy of segregation on the federal government. For the first time in 1913, we had a 50-year period after the Civil War where that wasn't the case. He imposed segregation on the federal civil service. Curtains were placed in federal government offices separating black and white clerical workers. Um, all African Americans who were supervising whites uh, were, were fired because it was no longer permitted for African Americans to supervise whites. Uh, separate washrooms were placed in the basements of uh, federal buildings for African Americans. It hadn't existed before. One of the largest federal um, departments at that time was the Navy Department. Uh, we didn't have the kind of big federal government we have now. The Navy Department was the largest federal department, and the official uh, who was responsible for implementing the policy of segregation in the Navy Department was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy. So here's a history quiz for you. Who was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy in 1913 who imposed segregation on the Navy Department? Oh, come on. You don't know who the Assistant Secretary of the Navy was in 1913? No, we don't. We don't. We don't. His name was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Wow. So this was the culture of the Democratic Party. It was a progressive party on economic policy, but it was a segregationist party, not just in the South, but in the North. And that um, is something that... Uh, the Democratic Party today has a lot to make amends for. Thank you. As we get ready to wind down, I think you all would agree that the conversation today is the conversation our nation needs to have. Wouldn't you agree? And the information shared by our panelists, their expertise, I guess if I could have a fantasy or dream, 
I would love to see us get to a place where we're all on CNN <laughs> <laughs> and having a national conversation about these issues so the nation could hear it. NARAB, we see a way forward. We start this conversation by saying we do not see ourselves as just wallowing in discussing the problem and the history, but also talking about solutions. And so from a policy perspective, NARAB has looked at three primary policy principles that we believe we want to help push forward in this country. And the first is that the government must promote home ownership as a high priority public policy, period. Now, I know Jim, he made the comment that we don't need more subsidies, that type of thing. Hmm. Not start with subsidies. Let's not start with subsidy, but I want to start with a subsidy. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that we need to push for a tax advantage, first time home buyer down payment savings vehicle, similar to the 529 plan. Hmm. Because one of the biggest barriers to home ownership in this country yeah, is down payment. And as we heard today, when you look at the net worth of most black families, probably less than $2,000, it's almost impossible. If you only have $2,000 in your bank account, where are you going to get the money for a down payment? You can't even dream about getting a conventional loan. Secondly, we believe that there must be no hereditary or arbitrary class distinctions for those seeking home mortgages. The government must prevent biases or privileges in the mortgage origination process and ensure consistent pricing and terms for similarly situated borrowers with no penalties for higher prices based on neighborhoods, zip codes, census tracts. We have to treat all borrowers the same whether you live in Capitol Heights or whether you live in Potomac. And lastly, there needs to be a federal accountability structure for the expanding non-depository lending market that will monitor their originations and just ensure that fair lending practices are adhered to for non-bank lenders as well. Now, if you found today's discussion valuable, the entire video will be posted on the NARAB website, the NARAB.com, and please share it with others. Today, I just want to give a special thanks to one of our partners who have been supporting us for the past five years, and that's the Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco. Kevin Blackburn, would you please stand? Dwight Alexander Wavy, Dwight in the room, right here. It's because of you. You have been a, a supporter and funder of our State of Housing in Black America report for the past five years, and we hope to continue to publish this report continue with our research, and continue our conversations on an annual basis. And I'm so grateful. Our panelists are no strangers to us. They have been supportive of NARAB. Maurice, Jim, Lisa, Elena, your work is so important. And we hope to continue to collaborate with you all moving forward. The future is bright for the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, and we're inspired. And if any person in this room 
If you're not a realtor, I would encourage you to join the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, one of the local chapters that are located in over 90 cities across the country. I'm sure the members that people in this room live in a city where there is a NARAB local chapter. And I want to encourage you to join and get involved in the fight to help increase and elevate the rate of black homeownership in this country. It is so important. Please don't forget and please take advantage of the opportunity to purchase The Color of Law with our author. Uh, I love to purchase and read books. And it's especially, it's, it's always real special when you can have a book signed by the author. And so please support uh, Mr. Rothstein and his work is extremely inspiring. And I believe just so deeply that once we begin to understand history, it really just inspires us to act. And that's why we wanted to have the conversation that we had today. And I can feel in this room that there are many inspired people, and I just want to thank you all for being here. Thank you so much. We do have tokens of appreciation for our panelists. If our executive director is in the room, Mr. Antoine Thompson, we are going to give away some door prizes. And if you would help me share those door prizes with our guests, I don't know if, how many got a ticket, but well, we put their name in the hat. We got a bucket. <laughs> OK. But thank you very much. And again, uh, don't leave yet. We got some door prizes. And uh, Antoine is going to uh, uh, conclude this session for us. Let's put our hands together one more time for President Hicks and all of our panelists. Mark Alston, the chair of our, our Public Affairs Committee, Lisa Rice, Maurice Jordanel, Lana McCargo, Jim Carr, who's been with us for a long time, and Mr. Rothstein, thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you, President Hicks, for a great job. Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Before I redo the raffle, I want to acknowledge my mom, who's come to her first NARAB event. Uh, standing up in the back there, Wanda Howard came all over here from uh, Buffalo. It's not snowing today. <laughs> uh, just a couple things they gave me to mention. Uh, the video of today will be on the NARAB website at nareb.com. You can also go on Facebook today. If you go to NARAB.com and click on our Facebook, the video was live streamed and you can actually watch it as often as you would like. As indicated, the uh, book signing will be in the back of the room. Mr. Rothstein will uh, have the book signing. We also like to thank all of our staff, consultants, and volunteers, <laughs> our past presidents that are here. I believe we have two past presidents of NARAB that are here, if they can stand up as well and be acknowledged, uh, Mr. Spivey and Mr. Bernie Jackson. We also like to uh, acknowledge our chair of the board and our officers and chief of staff, if they could be acknowledged as well. Thank you for their work. We also want to thank Congressman Meeks as well. His office has been a godsend uh, in helping us grow this event, as you heard him talk about earlier. Uh, one uh, last thing we want to do before we do the raffle is in May of 2018, 2019, we're going to have a policy conference. So we want to go from discussion to legislative action. And so our President Hicks has made, uh, made it possible for us to have a policy discussion so we can uh, we have some policy principles that are available. And so we want to make sure that you join us here in May so we talk about some issues and we knock on some doors. All right? That's right. Well, you ready? Realtors rocks. Nay rap, Realtors rocks. All right, so now we get down to the raffle. All right, we have two um, Visa gift cards, and uh, we want to 
Raffle those off. All right. <laughs> the first is, I got to take off my glasses, you know. At a certain age, you got to take off your glasses to read. Uh, six, eight, eight. Anyone have that? <laughs> seven, eight, seven, two. Six, eight, eight, seven, eight, seven, two. Six, eight, eight, seven, eight, seven. Come on, all right. Prize number one, come on up, bring your ticket up. Unless you don't want it. Don't spend all your money at one place either. All right, the next one um, we'll do so we keep the clock moving. Uh, the next is 688-7944. 688-7944. Going once. 688-7944. Going once. Twice. Twice. Gone. <laughs> You can bring up a ticket. You, ne you never win anything. Well, you won today. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> the next one is 688 7861. 688 7861. Do we got a winner? Who has the ticket? Okay, come on down. All the way from the back. All right. She's looking twice, three times, she's making sure she can. <laughs> yep, yeah, let's bring it on up. All right, all right. I hope you got it for your sake. <laughs> no, it's yours. You got it. I'm just messing with <laughs> Thank you all. God bless and thanks for coming. This is it. Thank you. Thanks for coming. God bless.